Bibles, go ahead and, and uh, turn to 1 Samuel 27. This morning, I'm going to be speaking on that one season. I don't care what you think or if you rather, uh, if you want to admit it or not, everybody in this place has that one season in their life. Everybody has that one time that they were acting a fool. I could think of plenty of times. I try to just not even remember them. Half the time I was intoxicated <laughs> under the influence. But you always have that one person that always reminds you. Maybe even while you're serving God, I'm sure even the times that we're serving God, we might have said something foolish or did something real uh, uh, weird, you know. I could think of one time, one time we're in Newport. And Pastor Sonny asked me a question and I froze up. Every time we go to Newport, Pastor George always reminds me. <laughs> Pastor George is that one guy. <laughs> and if King David was alive, I guess I would be that one guy. King David is probably like, oh, my God, why are you going to talk, talk about that one season I had? See, a lot of preachers and a lot of ministers, they always speak about the great things that David went through. Which, by all means, he was one of the greatest, greatest generals, one of the greatest leaders. The Bible describes that he was a man after God's own heart. God didn't entitle that to anybody else in the Bible but David. That's a big statement for God to say, hey, this guy is a man after my own heart. God didn't entitle that to nobody else in the Bible that's recorded in every, every, the Bible. But yet David had that one season. That one season is in his life that I want to share about. Right here in 1 Samuel 27, it says, but David threw out, but David thought to himself, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. Be careful what you think of. See, even though David didn't discuss this with anybody, David didn't mention it verbally, nobody heard him, but God heard him. Be careful what you think of. See, David was at a low moment in his time, in a mo mo uh, low moment of his, uh, uh, you know, leadership. And he was thinking real low of himself. It says, but David thought to himself, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel and I will slip away out of his hand. Verse 2, it says, David and the 600 men with him left and went over to Achish, son of Moab, king of Gath. David and his men settled in Gath with Achish. Each man had his family with him. And David had two wives, Anoam of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, the widow of Nabal. When Saul was told that David had fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. Then David said to Achish, if I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be assigned to me in one of your country towns, that I might live there. Why should your servant live in a royal city with you? There goes David thinking real low of himself. So that day Achish gave him Ziklag, and, had his, and it has belonged to the kings of Judea ever since. David lived in the Philistines' territory a year and four months. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, God. We just thank you for your awesome word, God. We can sense your presence here in this place, God. We pray, God, that you open our minds and open our hearts this morning, God, as you minister to us in the name of Jesus. Everybody says? Amen. I'm going to give you a little backstory real quick. And I was reading chapter 27. In chapter 26, we read that David was fleeing from Saul, from his leader that he loved so much. He was the king and his mentor in his life. And we see in verse 26 that David had an opportunity to kill King Saul. Right there, they found him slipping. Come on. Have you ever caught anybody slipping? Don't raise your hand. 
David and his armor bearer in, verse, in chapter 26, I'm not going to go there for the sake of time, but they caught King Saul slipping. He was asleep right there with a spear right next to him. And uh, David's men around him were loyal. They were straight killers. They had his back. One of his armor bearers said, David, look it. We caught him slipping. He's asleep with his spear next to him. All I got to do is pick up that spear and give him one thrust. I don't need two tries, three times. David, just give me one time and I can finish him. And look at what David said. David said, he said, we will not touch the Lord's anointed. David didn't want to take it in into his own hands, but he knew that if somebody was against him, he'll just leave it up to God for God to take care of it. See, too many of us nowadays will take things into our own hands. But David trusted in the Lord. And I could imagine, how, how many of you guys ever been in the run? <laughs> not here, not in this church. We're, you know, we're college graduates. Okay, how many of you guys ever played hide and go seek? After a, if you hide so good, if you're you're like, man, I, I picked a really great hiding spot. After a while, you get tired, get a little hungry, get a little weary. Like, my God, I hit so good they couldn't even find me. No, they just gave up searching for you. See, David was on the run, and he got tired from running from Saul. And that's where we're going to pick up again. I'm going to read this verse again, 1 Samuel 27, 1. It says, but David thought to himself, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I can do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel and I'll slip out of his hands. What do we see here? That David was making excuses. See, when we have a lot of pressure and a lot of things are going on in our life, whether it's uh, marriage pressure, ministry pressure, just pressure in life, financial pressure, sometimes we forget about the promises of God. Sometimes we forget all the promises that God gave us in our prayer, in our secret prayer time, or the, the scriptures that God gave us as we read God's word, or the words that God has given us through different people. When a lot of pressure is upon our life, we forget about our past. It's funny that David forgot because David had a track history with God. How many of us here have a track history with God? See, David forgot that he delivered him from the, the, the palm of the lion and the bear. He delivered him from Goliath. He delivered him from a lot of different situations. But David was going through a season where he forgot about the promises of God. I know I could relate with David. I, I'm human. Just because I'm, I'm, I'm up here with the mic doesn't mean I got flowers. Come on. I'm human just like you. Sometimes we forget about the, the promises of God. We forget about our secret time with the Lord. And sometimes we focus on our problem and not focus on God. David was a man after God's own heart. But yet he forgot about the promises. He forgot when he was a teenager and they anointed him over oil and said, one day you're going to be the greatest king that Israel has ever seen. When he was in this season, all that slipped out of his mind and out of his heart. If you're going through that season right now, I want to encourage you, you're not alone. You're not alone. God is with you. God is going to walk you through. God is going to see you through. The Bible says that he'll level every mountain and make every crooked path straight. Just focus on the Lord and on the promises of God, and God will see you through. David was making excuses to lay down his sword. God created every single one of us packing. Come on. Of your packing, don't raise your hand. We need you. We're going to start a little group after this called the, the Armor Bearer Ministry. Back then they had swords. Well, look at when uh, they came to arrest uh, Jesus. Well, uh, they pulled out a sword and chopped off the guy's ear, right? What does that mean? That Jesus' crew was packing. Yeah. 
God created every single one of us with a gift and with a weapon of choice. Your weapon is different than uh, my weapon and my weapon is different than your weapon. Some of us have the weapon of serving, have the weapon of worship, have the weapon of preaching. Some of you have the weapon of giving and reaching. Some of you guys have a weapon of healing. Every single one of us have a weapon. David had a weapon of killing and a weapon of leadership. And David was trying to find an excuse to lay down his sword. We only, uh, there's only two recordings of the Bible that David laid down his sword. And the, uh, the first one, or the second one, the first one was this one. And the second one was when he was on the, uh, the, what do you call that? He was in his room on the balcony. Most famous sin that he did. He was on the balcony while all his men were at war and he looked over. But nevertheless, David fell into sin. Why? Because he laid down his sword. God never created you and I to lay down our sword. Of your thinking about it, of your contemplating about it, we have models in the Bible. David laid down his sword twice and he fell into sin. God never created us to lay down our sword. Keep on swinging. We have models and examples like Pastor Sonny and Sister Julie. They've been swinging their sword for 50 years plus. Pastor Sonny and Sister Julie, they could lay down their sword. They, they could retire and nobody could say anything about them. Look at what God has used them to do. But yet they are still fighting. Yet they are still swinging. Yet they're still in party. Yet they're still discipling. Yet they're still traveling the world to reach God's people. What great examples do we have in the Bible and examples that we have physically. We have leaders in modern day warriors that will not let their sword down. God never created us to put our sword in a shelf, our sword in a closet. You need to get it and start swinging. When we swing our sword, we're examples to others. We bring inspiration to our family. Whether you like it or not or whether you receive it or not, you are a model to someone. Someone is watching you. Your family members are looking at you. Your grandchildren are looking at you. Your nephews, your nieces, whoever is in your circle, they are looking at you. Your city, your community, the world. We're not a part of an ordinary ministry. We're a part of a worldwide movement. The world is counting on you to serve God. The, Lord, the, the world is counting on you to swing your sword. Swing that thing. David was trying to make an excuse to lay down his sword. David was making plenty of excuses. And what did he do? Then he wanted to go back to Gath. If you study uh, Gath, Gath is where David had one of the greatest victories of his leadership of his lifetime. The city of Gath is where he slayed the, uh, the giant. And the devil was whispering in his ear, go back to Gath. See, God doesn't want us to go backwards. God doesn't want us to focus on our past victories. If we're focused on our past victories, it's to draw, not to dwell. See, the devil wanted uh, David to dwell in his past. Some of you might be thinking about to go back. Man, I'm, I'm going to move out of L.A. It's too expensive. I don't think this church is for me. I don't think this place is for me. No, that's a lie of the enemy. If God has called you here, if God has placed you here in third wave LA, God didn't make it an accident, but God called you here for a purpose to raise up leaders, to ship them all over the world. Don't go back to Gath. That's the devil. The devil wants you to go backwards. We don't serve a God of, of uh, going backwards, but we serve a God that wants you to keep on trucking and keep on going forward. God wants you to swing your sword and make new victories and make new memories. God has anointed you and appointed you for this time. That's some power right there. David was making excuses and the devil wanted him to go backwards and go to Gap. And David was falling trapped in the devil's lies. Sometimes the devil's lies are louder than anything else. 
Sometimes the devil's voice is louder than the pastor's voice or louder than God's voice. Sometimes the devil's voice is so loud, you get answers and you just want to do it. Get it over with. Don't fall for it. David is a great example. He fell for it. And he went backwards to the city of Gath. David was trying to find acceptance. Right here in 1 Samuel 26, verse 6, he said, it says right here, So on that day, Achish gave him Ziklag, and it has belonged to the king of Judea ever since. He went back and he was trying to find acceptance. You know, David had a big problem. David had a lot of problems. But yet, let me remind you, he was a man after God's own heart. But yet, he was one of the greatest leaders that we ever read about. One of the greatest disciplers in training. He discipled a cave full of misfits to be the greatest army of his time. David struggled with a lot of insecurities. He struggled with rejection. He was rejected by his father. He was rejected by his brother. He was even rejected by the man of God, Samuel. Imagine that, how low and how crazy that must have felt. He got rejected by the prophet Samuel. He got, uh, he got rejected by the king. And we even read later on that even his own men were rejecting him and they were talking about stoning him. When we have rejection problems, we just want to feel accepted. We just want to find anywhere where I, we can feel accepted and feel belong. And David was feeling rejected by his king, by his leader that he loved so much. He played the heart for him. He did everything for uh, King Saul. But yeah, he was feeling rejected and he wanted to feel accepted. The first thing when, when we don't have nowhere to go, where do we go? We end up going backwards where it feels comfortable. So David wanted to go backwards to King uh, to to Gath. He wanted to go to the Philistines' army. Uh, just to make mention, I don't know if I said this. Gath, the city of Gath, and the Philistines hated Israel, and they hated God. David went back to try to find acceptance from a king that hated God. We read before that David tried to go with them before, and David was. Uh, all crazy. He was acting crazy. This is the second encounter that David came with King Achish. The first time King Achish didn't even want him in his presence. David was drooling from the mouth. His hair was all crazy. And he looked all weird. And King Achish said, get this peasant out of my sight. Why? Because I believe David didn't have nothing to offer him yet. God was barely ra rising him up. The second time that David encountered King Achish, David had something to offer the Bible describes that he had over 400 men, and I can imagine they had their women and their children. David had some money. Come on. David probably had the freshest uh, chariot at the time. He probably had the dopest sword, exclusive sword. And then King Achish said, oh, yeah, come on. I could accept you back. you got something to offer. Isn't that funny? When once God starts raising us up and providing for us and we start getting blessed, sometimes we forget about God and we want to go backwards. The world might be rejecting you now, but give it five, ten years. Once you got some things, they'll welcome you with the open arms. Why? Because they want to use you and abuse you. David was trying to find an acceptance from the enemy of God. And what happened, the enemy didn't only just accept them, but the king said, I'm not only going to allow you to come to my kingdom, but I'm going to give you a piece of land. Come on. Sometimes the devil tries to entice us and says, hey, if you leave that church, if you leave that group of people, come over here. Look at what I'll give you. I'll give you this career. I think I said it Wednesday, a prime example, when the devil took up Jesus to the highest point of the mountain and and the devil said, I could give you the kingdoms of this world if you bow down in an instant and serve me. The devil always wants to give us something that God already intended us for. It. But a lot of times, people want it instant. People want it right away. 
David was trying to find his refuge in the Philistine army. And he was trying to find acceptance in someone that really didn't like him. Have you ever been around somebody that really didn't like you? But they were using you. They just allowed you to come because, you, you know, you, you had beer money or you had, you know, you had some stuff to offer them. We don't do that in Christianity because we all love each other, right? Have you ever hung around with somebody that, you know, deep down inside, you're like, oh, this guy's just using me. That was King of Kish. He just was using David because he had money, he had resources, he had men that knew how to fight, he had men that had women. He had something to offer, and King of Kish was just using them. And he gave him Ziklag. Look up that word Ziklag. It means a winding. The enemy gave him a land called winding. The devil just wants us to go back to where we came from and just keep on going in circles and circles and circles. If you want to get to the East Coast by car, you're not going to go to Fontana Speedway, right? If you go on a speed track, you're just going to go in circles. You're not going to get very far. That's the track that the devil wants you on. That's the track the enemy's trying to persuade you to go on. If you want to get far, I'm here to let you know this morning, third wave LA, God has a destiny. God has a future. But first, you got to get out of Ziklag. First, you got to get out of that winding road. If you want to get to where God wants you to go, you got to follow his direction. But too, too many of us like going in circles. I like being dizzy, Pastor. I like keep on going nowhere. I, I feel like I'm going to touch it. No, you're never going to touch it. Get on God's will and get on God's plan. God's plan. Not your plan, but God's plan. And God will blow your mind like no other. I could sit here and speak with all conviction, with everything in my heart. God has blown my mind. God has blown my heart year after year after year after year after year after year after year. God will blow your mind. But you got to let him. You got to say, God, take the wheel. I'm tired of trying to look for my, I'm trying to, I'm tired of holding on to my life. The Bible says that if you hold on to your life, you will what? Lose it. But the moment, a little over 10 years ago, I said, God, I'm tired of being on that winding road. I'm tired of keep on going in circles and circles. God, here's my life. And guess what? When I surrendered my life, God gave it to me in full. God restored my mind. God restored my family. God restored everything. I'm living a dream. God gave me a beautiful wife. See, even when I was trying to be disobedient and go to the Midwest, you know, something good came out of it. David was rejected. David was trying to prove himself. David was feeling in a low place. You, you would think that a man of God like that would remember. Would remember what to do. Right here in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 30, it says, the enemy stripped everything from David. David and his men reached Ziklag. On the third day, now the Amalekites had raided Negev and Ziklag, and they had attacked Ziglag and burned it. So this is already a year and four months. I'm going to remind you guys. A year and four months, David was running from God. See, David got to a point where, where God allowed everything to get stripped from him. I'm bringing this out because we're about to enter in one of the greatest seasons in our lives, one of the greatest seasons in our ministry, one of the greatest seasons in Third Wave LA. We're about to step into mega miracle territory, but we can't hold on to our past. See, some of us are holding on to our past mistakes and to our past victories, but I'm here to let you know we got to release them so we can step into the future that God has called us to be. See, 
God allowed everything to be stripped away from David. David lost everything. David lost his wife. David lost his finances. David, see, when God starts raising us up, we don't just make decisions for us anymore. Our decisions affect everyone around us. So be careful what kind of decisions you make. Always include God into the decisions that we make because when God is with us, God will be before us. So right here we read in 1 Samuel 30 that David got, got everything stripped away. And then fi somebody say finally. finally. Finally David came to his senses. And I could imagine he got tired of, of people talking about him. He got tired of being used. He got tired of being burned. And finally the Bible describes in verse chapter 30 that he prayed unto the Lord. The moment David humbled himself, he prayed. What the Bible says that God gave him everything back. If you're in a season, a prayerless season, I'm here to let you know the moment you pray, God will refresh you. God will give you a second wind. God will provide for you. God will give you the desires of your heart. David finally humbled himself and prayed. The Bible describes, of my people will what? Humble myself, humble themselves. Of my people will humble themselves. I will heal their land and bless them. Just humble ourselves. We just got to humble ourselves. We all go through seasons of David, the greatest man of God, struggled with prayer. I could imagine there are some, some of us in here struggling with prayer. We all go through seasons. I admit I've been through seasons where I struggle with prayer, where I didn't know I was just hitting a wall. I was just talking to nobody. But those are the moments that we have to fight even stronger. We got to pray even louder. We got to pray even harder because our family are counting on us to pray. Our generation is counting on us to pray. When we pray and bow down, we're telling everybody in the house, I got your back. When I get on my knees every morning, I'm telling you guys, I got your back. These are great examples that we can learn from David. And what happened, David went to a, a season of revival as the keyboard makes his way. All you got to do is pray. All you got to do is pray. The moment we humble ourselves and pray, my God, the sky's the limit. The Bible describes that he finally humbled himself and prayed, and then God gave him victory after victory after victory. David was one of the greatest men in the Bible, but yet he had a season that he struggled with prayer. Fourteen long months. My God, I would have probably been out there 14 months. I think the longest is like a, a week during like conventions, you know. Kind of yeah. kind of rough praying during conventions. Our mind is constantly thinking of the opposite of what God wants us to do. As long as we're living in this fleshly body, our flesh is going to want everything that the flesh desires. We're going to want everything that makes me what? Feel good. Everything that makes me feel good. When God is telling us we have to die to ourselves. As everybody stands up. We can learn from this man of God. David was a great man of God that we can learn from. That's why I love reading his stories because I can relate to David. David went through struggles. He went through insecurities. He went through seasons of, of not praying. He went through different seasons. He probably encountered every single season that we could think of and much more. But yet he was a man of God. Whatever you're going through this morning... Whatever, whatever you're facing, whatever struggles you're going through, if you're having challenging reading, if you're having a season of challenging, of praying, uh, I'm here to let you know you're still a man of God. You're still a woman of God. David went through it, and he still came on top. 
If you're going through it, you're going to still come on top. God didn't create us to lose or to fail, but God created us to win and to be successful. If David was alive, I could chill with this guy. I could relate to him. I could, I could vent him. I've been through seasons that David has been through. He's been through every season, but yet he still came out on top. Why? Because David wasn't focused about anything else, but he always was focused on giving me a new heart. David loved God so much that he chased them. We might be facing a situation right now where we want to do so. We want to go backwards. We want to go back to where we came from. Man, it was easier back there. It was easier before Christ. It, it was easier. I don't The moment I said yes to Jesus, the moment all my emotions just started rising up. I didn't have no emotions. But the moment I got sober, the moment I said yes to Jesus, I started getting all these feelings and all these emotions. Oh, my God, is this what it feels? Yeah, we're going to go through an emotional roller coaster. But as long as we pray and we seek the face of God, God will give us self-control. God will give us the, the same God that transformed you is the same God that will keep you. The same God that reached you is the same God that will keep you. But we got to fall in love with God and know that we are people of mistakes, but we serve a God that is flawless that will keep us. My question is, will you humble yourself? A man full of pride will not bow down. But a man or a woman that is humble before the Lord will bow down and lay down all his problems and all her problems to the Lord and say, I know when I'm weak, you are strong. Lord, I am more than a conqueror, not because who I am, but because who you are. God, I know no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived the things that God has prepared. Yet nobody knows the path that God has for you but God. Jesus loves you. He wants us to get off that road. We're going to need all the warriors we can. We're going to need all the prayer that we need. We are going into enemy territory in the city of Hollywood. We're going to need all of us to lock arms together and say, we got your back. I got you. So we could advance the kingdom of God. As everybody raises their hands and worship God.